Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Time to get started for the school class. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us, for bringing us here safely. We praise you. We ask for your spirit to lead us and guide us and give us wisdom. Uh, during this class, you know, we ask for your support, your strength, your help through the whole thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our lesson is number one, the war behind all wars. The memory text. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon with his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. If God's so good, then why is the world so bad? How can God, a God of love, allow so much evil to exist? And why do bad things happen to good people? In this lesson, we will explore an age-long conflict between good and evil, beginning with Lucifer's rebellion in heaven. We will examine the origin of uh, evil and God's long-suffering in dealing with the sin problem. So God is a God of incredible love. His very nature is love. All of his actions are loving. Love can never be forced, coerced, or legislated. And only by love is love awakened. To deny the power of choice is to destroy the ability to love. And to destroy the ability to love is to eradicate the possibility of being truly happy. God wins our allegiance uh, by his love. He's dealing with a great controversy between good and evil in such a way that sin will never arise in the universe again. God's purpose is to demonstrate before the entire universe that he has always acted in our best interest. Uh, looking at the world through the lens of God's love in the light of, great, of the great controversy between good and evil reassures us of that right will triumph over wrong and will do so forever. Now, one of the questions up front here was, if God is so good, why is the world so bad? And uh, I think we all know that the world is not all on God's side. <clears throat> and because of the things that took place in heaven, uh, and Lucifer coming down to see us and lead us astray, uh, many have followed after him. But we're going to get more into that uh, later here. And then um, how can a God of love allow so much evil to exist? And I've said it before probably a million times, you know, how can you how can you truly hate sin if you've never experienced it? Like God hates sin, you know? And we go through this things, we go through things, we hurt people, people hurt us, you know, it's a world full of bad things happening. And when bad things happen to your family, you know, it hurts you. And by being hurt, by these sinful things, you can learn to hate them real quick. Um, putting them in your life, uh, putting those things in your life to get rid of that sin is the important part of that lesson, I think. So let's go ahead and go on to Sunday's lesson. Uh, Revelation 12, 
verses uh, seven through nine is, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his archangels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed, I'm sorry, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, and was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that's the big part of the problem here on earth right there. Actually, it's all the problem, huh? Okay. So the question is, is uh, what does this passage reveal about the freedom that exists in heaven or the origin when Lucifer rebelled? In what ways could God have responded? So that is the question I want to ask you. Um, we know that he gave us free will, just as the angels had free will in heaven. Um, but what ways could God have responded to the uh, things that Lucifer was doing? How could he have handled that? He could have, he could have just wiped him out, right? But then my daughter, as I was reading it to my daughter, she says, yeah, but, you know, that'd be basically fear, <laughs> and it wouldn't be love, you know? And then she's right. Everybody be fearing God more than loving him. This is pretty much God on the stand. What, a, what a kind of a God are we serving here? You see, right? But he did that with the flood. I'm sorry? He did wipe out everything with the flood. So what's the difference? Yes, he did. There was a lot. That was, there was a lot going on there. The sins reached God, the sins of the world. Um, um, there's different opinions on that. Uh, and, uh, go ahead, Dan. Uh, you know me too well. <laughs> so, um, I think the difference there, um, here, here are the similarities and differences. In the time of Noah, he gave, how many years did Noah preach to the people? Do you guys, 120th, I believe it was, yeah? I think you're right. So um, that's a long time, I think, to give people a chance to change and, and repent. Um, so we see a, a time of kind of probation for them or a time to do the right thing. And with Satan, um, I'm sure he gave him time to do the right thing. And, but also this isn't just about justice for Satan, this is about justice for his character, because now the entire universe is thinking that God is unjust, and now they need to prove, he needs to prove that he's just and that Satan's plan isn't just. Thank you. You know, right along with what you're saying there, and this isn't in the lesson, but um, I think it's worth saying. You know, a lot of the world believes that when you, when you die, you go to heaven or hell, and hell is a place of fire and torment forever and eternity. And I like, I've been studying that for quite some time now, and I've found passages that are quite clear about uh, the fire, the lake of fire basically burns up until there's nothing. And it, there's even in Ezekiel, there's a passage that says that Satan will be no more. You know, so if Satan will be no more, how could he be burning forever and eternity? But what kind of a God would do that to you if you made a few mistakes in your life and you never accepted him and those sins that you had were few, but nonetheless, you never repented or followed Jesus, so bam, there you are, and here we got a loving God burning you forever and eternity, while meanwhile you're in heaven watching your family 
burn forever and eternity. That's not a loving God. And that's not what our Bible teaches us. But the general population believes the things they hear instead of going to the Word and finding out for themselves. And God does get a bad rap. When Satan was pushed down here, he started off with lies leading Eve astray. And now those different lies have been put into the minds of the people and they believe already without even opening their word. They've already got their minds made up of what's going on. So God's character is very much on the line. <clears throat> and I think that's a, a great reason for us to be able to uh, walk the walk as righteously as we can because we are representatives. So, these verses describe a cosmic conflict between good and evil. Satan and his angels warred against Christ and eventually were cast out of heaven. It seems extremely strange that war would break out in such a perfect place as heaven. So why did it happen? Um, did a loving God create a demonic angel who invited this war? Was there some fatal flaw in, in this angel that led him to rebel? The Bible explains the origin of evil and it draws a curtain aside in this conflict between good and evil. Um, you know, Satan was made a perfect, he was perfect in all of his ways. Everything about him was perfect. Um, or Lucifer, rather, and I'm seeing selfishness as the main root cause for his fall. Uh, along with that selfishness comes pride and other things. So I uh, want to go to Ezekiel 28. Clouds. 
I will be like the Most High. So what went on in the mind of, of this angelic being called Lucifer that led to his rebellion? So he, he liked a lot of what God had, and he wanted it, and, but for one reason or another, he thought he was better than God, and what exactly transpired, um, I don't know, it, it doesn't really say what the motive was, but we get the idea that <laughs> iniquity was found in him. <clears throat> Okay, um, the heavenly councils pleaded with Lucifer, just as you were talking about, Dan. Uh, the son of um, Lucifer, the son of God, presented before him the greatness, the goodness, and the justice of the Creator, and the sacred, unchanging nature of His law. God himself had established the order of heaven, and in departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his maker and bring ruin upon himself. But the warning, given the, in infinite love and mercy, only aroused a spirit of resistance. And that Ellen White. So, I think we pretty much covered what happened there. I don't think we need to get too much deeper into that. <clears throat> okay, let's go to Monday's lesson. Lucifer deceives, Christ prevails. So Satan's pride uh, ripened in open rebellion. Uh, he accused God of being unjust and unfair. He infected the angels with the, his doubts and accusations. So, uh, the passage of uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, what does this passage reveal about Satan's ability to deceive? Um, how many of the angels fell for his lies about God? So we already know it's, that passage is one third of his angels and him uh, were cast out, rather one third of the angels and him were cast out to the earth. Uh, so if Satan was able to deceive one third of the angels who lived with God in heaven, I'm in my notes now, sorry how much easier would it be to deceive man in a fallen state who never seen God? Uh, how much more important is it to keep ourselves in God's word and live by faith? In Mark uh, 12, verse 30, our Lord tells us to love the Lord with all thy mind and with all thy strength. Uh, so here you've got angels that have been in heaven living with God, and all of a sudden there's a problem from the throne of God, the cherubim up there covering the throne decides he's going to make a new way, and he starts sharing with the other angels. How long have they been there with God? I don't know, but he was smart enough to deceive those angels. Um, that's like pretty scary stuff. That's, we rely on angels at times to help us. We don't know it, but it's the Lord sending his angels to us. And we're learning this stuff, trying to figure it all out. But we gotta be very careful because it's easy to twist truth. It's easy to deceive. And here we are, uh, born into sin to begin with. And that has been our way until we came to know Christ. And for me, it was like 40 years of my life, I've been deceived, thinking that everything was okay. Uh, then all of a sudden, the Lord shook me and 
started leading me down the right path. And it's taken a long time because there's a lot of untruth out there. So I think it's really important that we make each and every day, all day, a relationship with the Lord. Uh, while you're at work, think on Him. Uh, more and more, the Lord's impressing me that moment by moment is what I need. And it's true, I do. Uh, sometimes I get so caught up that I forget uh, to speak with the Lord or share with the Lord or just be focused on Him because I'm getting caught up in the things that I'm doing. <clears throat> One thing is certain about the war in heaven, every angel had to decide for or against Christ. Whom will they follow? So like the angels in heaven, we have to make a choice. Will we follow God or Satan? Remember, by not choosing, you've made a choice for Satan's side. God has demonstrated his love at the cross he also gave his word, for by beholding we become. I love what God is doing in me, personally. I see the change, and there's a lot more change that needs to be done. Um, this too builds my faith. We need to be obedient to his commands while learning com uh, completely on our Lord. I'm sorry, leaning completely on our Lord for all the things. Um, not I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. We need to be, uh, our actions are, we need to be covered in his peace, drowned in his peace, so that when the things come upon us, our self doesn't react, but the Lord would react if necessary. Okay, let's go on to Tuesday's lesson. So, uh, planet Earth becomes involved. Adam and Eve were given the same freedom of choice the angels had. We know this because of the tree of knowledge. Um, I wonder if anyone would have eaten from the tree had Satan not tempted Eve. If not, it would have been very, very different for us all here. Um, now, because they did, the ultimate result of sin was death for all mankind. Now, we have a Savior who forgives our sins. However, if we do not turn from our sins, we will perish with Satan and all who follow after him in the lake of fire. Now, many serve God out of fear because they believe God allows the lost to burn in hell for eternity, uh, while the saints enjoy paradise for eternity. But the wages of sin is death, and the Bible refers to it as the second death. And like I said earlier in Ezekiel 28, 18 through 19, it says, God will bring forth a fire that shall devour Satan, bringing him to ashes, and Satan will be no more. Uh, see, Satan creates lies like burning forever, uh, nonstop, to make God look unfair and uncaring. However, the truth is our God is a loving God full of mercy, and hell fire is also said to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. It's completely destroyed, and it is no longer on fire. You just basically have ash. Um, JC? Yes. That verse that you mentioned in Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the word forever, but it's not still burning today. Right. And um, if you think about it, I heard a sermon from David Ashrick once. He, how fair is it that Satan, who lived comparably in eternity before, longer than us in our mere grain of sand of existence, so we get to burn as long as he burns for, like, 
a speck of time in, in eternity of sin. We get, we get to burn as, as long as he did for, you know, when he lived way longer and sinned way longer than us, that's not just in any way. Or the person that sinned and died close to creation, he's, let's say he's burning right now. He's burned for 6,000 years. We sin and die, so he gets to burn 6,000 years longer than us. That's so, like, how fair is that? <laughs> totally it's just unfair, huh? Ridiculous. Right. Mm. It's very, it's very ridiculous if you think about it like that. And thank you for sharing. I love David Asher. He's amazing. He really resonates with me. I learned that in, uh, when I was learning about all this stuff that the forever in the Bible means until an end. So it doesn't mean eternity. So if we're burning, it's until we turn to ash, and then it's over. Yeah, I also think that uh, each person will, will have his punishment like time, you know? If you just sin a little bit, you only burn a little bit and then become ash, but like Satan, he, like you said, Dan, was sinning for a very long time, still is. He's gonna burn the longest him and his angels, I think they'll burn the longest. Now, I had to back that up with scripture, but um, yeah. I mean, we use forever like that a lot ourselves when we're talking about, oh, it's been forever since I've seen you, or you know, that sort of thing. So yeah, um, when the Bible says it could be like Sodom and Gomorrah, that's what he meant. <laughs> It'll be done. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, anybody else got anything you want to share? Okay. Um, for Wednesday, um, I'm going to start off. Uh, today's lesson starts off with the after um, Adam and Eve's fall from grace. Uh, there were there any hope? Was there any hope for them? God told Satan, I will put an enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Uh, and I want you to take note of that. Um, your seed being Satan and her seed. Okay. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I want you to take note of that. Because we went from the woman to a man, right? He went from you and the woman to he and you. So I see the woman as the church and her seed as Jesus. So between you, let's say between you and the church and between your seed and her seed or Jesus, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So Satan bruised his heel, Jesus' heel on the cross. No bones were broken, but Jesus crushed his head. He, he literally destroyed Satan. Now he isn't completely destroyed right now, but um, we know who wins. So the, basically the first couple now had hope. So Galatians, uh, down here in the middle of the uh, Wednesday, said Galatians, 2 Corinthians, they paint a picture of Jesus' suffering for all humanity. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus was made to be sin who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. So our hope just got bigger. Do you ever wonder if God really loves you? Look at the cross. Look at the crown of thorns. Look at the nails in his hands and feet. With every drop of blood that Jesus shed on Calvary, God is saying, I love you. I do not want you to be, I do not want to be in heaven without you. 
I was talking to a friend, sharing Jesus with him, and he's like, I'm just not there. And I'm like, you know, he's an amazing guy. And I told him, I said, I, I, I don't want to be there without you. I mean, I do want to be there. But I'd love for him to be there, you know? Um, this is like God, is, he wants us all there. He, he created us for a reason, to have a relationship with us. Um, on my way in, I was thinking about uh, God. Sean Murphy put something on Facebook. It was pretty cool. Um, I can't exactly get it right, but I'll kind of come close. Um, the Spirit of God leads God's children. And uh, we, it's, it's, we cry out to God, Abba, Father. So our God isn't just a God. I'm God, I'm a judge. He's, he's also Father. A, a relationship, a family member, not just any family member. He's the head of the family, all of our families, and he's doing it right like a good dad, you know? So the relationship that we have with him is more personal than a God of gods, just basically God. It's, it's on a deeper, intimate level, I think. And it's a beautiful thing. Anyway, um, God is saying, I love you and I don't want to be without you in heaven. Yes, you've sinned. You've sold yourself into the land of the enemy, into the hand of the enemy. Yes, and, in, and of yourself, you are unworthy of eternal life. But I paid the ransom to get you back. When you look at the cross, you never have to wonder again if you're loved. So how do you look at yourself? And a lot of people I've talked to, and myself included, um, I look at myself at times like I don't measure up and I'm, I'm not, some people say I'm not pretty enough or I'm not good looking enough. Um, I'm not smart enough. And uh, basically what I'm saying is we could go on and on with the I'm not good enough thing in so many different ways, but the truth of the matter is that we shouldn't be looking at ourselves in that negative way because that's not how we were designed or created and then especially after you've come to know Jesus his price that he paid on the cross was so high that God our father gave his son to sacrifice for our sins so that we could be reunited with him and have that relationship. So the price of Christ's sacrifice was the highest. I don't think you could get any higher than that. That was the ultimate price. Now, when you look at yourself, you, you, you think, look at yourself like Jesus looks at you. Now, when Jesus looks at you, he looks at you like a treasure. Sometimes you just need to be polished up a little bit, you know? But you are so important to him that he died for you. That alone should mean something. But not only did he die, he suffered greatly. It was, this was the, probably the hardest type of death that you could experience, in my opinion. What he went through for us was way more than any of us experience in a lifetime. That means that the price that was paid was so great for us that we should be looking at ourselves a little bit more highly in a humble fashion, of course. So because we are so valued, Satan knows how valuable we are. We sell ourselves short, but Satan wants us 
bad. If he weren't worth anything, he wouldn't care. Now, of course, Satan's desire to have us is 180 degrees different than from what God's desire for us is. While well, God's is for our benefit in every way, shape, and form, Satan's is for our destruction in every way, shape, and form as God wants to use us to benefit the kingdom of heaven, to grow it. And uh, Satan's is to destroy the kingdom of heaven and use us to destroy others in the process. The Bible speaks of a Jesus who came to the world, ex experienced heartache, disappointment, and pain in common with all humanity. It reveals a Christ who faced the same temptations we faced, a Christ who triumphed over the principalities and powers and fell both in his life and through his death on the cross after, uh, I'm sorry, all for each one of us personally. Think about it, Jesus, the one who created the cosmos, stepped down from heaven and not only came into the fallen world but suffered in it ways none of us ever will. He did it because he loved us, each of us. And that alone should be a powerful reason for hope. So when Jesus uh, conquered death, uh, Jesus defeated Satan and paid the price for our salvation while demonstrating his perfect love. All last night I was trying to sleep and it was weird because I kept wanting to ask what, like who is, what's so special about Jesus? Well, that he is perfect love. So what's so special about God? He's perfect love. That's super, super special. Not one of us here understands perfect love. While we might think we do or have a good grasp on it, I think we all realize when we know God a little bit closer that uh, we don't. He's very, very awesome and amazing in ways that we can't comprehend. And in, in demonstrating that love on the cross is a, a good way to start. There's no greater love than one who will give his life for another. And he did it for all of us. Amen. It's, you're talking about demonstrating sorry, uh, his love for us. It's easy to love people that love you, and uh, but I mean, from day one, he was despised by his own people, and um, and us can't forget us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, that's amazing. Uh, that someone would love me before I deserve to be loved. It's, that says a lot. Um, well, Satan, on the other hand, would, you can see that his motive was to obtain power, so he only loved what brought him power. And that's completely, completely opposite to God's way of doing things. And he proved it. Amen. Absolutely. So we're getting pretty close here to the end. Um, Thursday, our high priest, uh, what Jesus did for us on the cross enables him also to intercede for us in heaven. Our resurrected Lord is our great high priest providing everything we need to be saved and to live in God's kingdom forever. Now the text that um, 
he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Excuse me. Um, Hebrews 4.15. Uh, and it adds, let us therefore come boldly, that means confidently, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. To state very simply, Jesus presents us before the universe clothed in his righteousness, saved by his death, and redeemed through his blood. Everything we should have been, he was. In Christ, there was no condemnation for the sins of our past. In Christ, our guilt is gone. And through his mighty intercession, the grip of sin on our lives is broken. The, claim, the chains that bind us are loosened and we are free. So what is Christ's longing desire in the great controversy there between good and evil? When, when the great sacrifice had been consummated, Christ ascended on high, refusing the adoration of angels until he had presented the request, I will that ye also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. In John 17, verse 24. Then, with inexpressible love and power came forth the answer from the Father's throne. Let all the angels of God worship him. Hebrews 1, 6, not a stain rested upon Jesus. His humiliation ended, his sacrifice completed. There was given unto him a name that is above every name. I wanna go well, we're going to read a little bit out of Ellen White's here. And then we're going to close. <clears throat> Christ represented his Father to the world, and he re uh, represents before God the chosen ones in whom he has restored to the moral image of God. They are his heritage, or his inheritance, if you will. To them, he says, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. No man knoweth the Father save the Son, and he to whomever the Son will reveal him. No priest, no religionist can reveal the Father to any son or daughter of Adam. Men have only one advocate, one intercessor, who is able to pardon transgression, shall not our hearts swell with gratitude to him who gave Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins? Think deeply upon the love of the Father has manifested in our behalf, the love that he has expressed for us. We cannot measure this love. The measurement, there is none. We can only point to Calvary to the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It is an infinite sacrifice, and we, com we comprehend and measure, can we comprehend and measure uh, in infinity? Uh, there was one more thing I saw on Facebook, and it, it was the Lamb that got consumed by the wolf was the one who wasn't with the shepherd. That kind of speaks volume, especially with what we've been reading today. Um, I think we need to go ahead and close so that we can start preparing for service. Would anybody care to uh, say a closing prayer? Okay, I'll go ahead and say it. Dear Lord, thank you so much for sharing with us those things that Jesus did for us and, and some of what he went through for us. Thank you for showing us how important we are to you. 
And thank you so much for that sacrifice that was made in our behalf to reconciliate, uh, reconciliate our, ourselves to you or to bring us closer to you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We ask that you please give us your spirit throughout this day that we might have more time spent with you more perfectly. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.